the Lord be with you. It's good to record um, a sermon for Sunday 15th of November, um, the second Sunday before Advent, as we're following it in the, the, the church's calendar. Um, our reading for today, the gospel reading for that Sunday is Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30. And you might like to follow that along um, as we consider what it is to be servants of God. Let us pray. Give us grace, O Lord, not only to hear thy word with our ears, but also to receive it into our hearts and to show it forth in our lives for the glory of thy great name. Amen. One of the most um, popular things that people watch uh, on television now, and particularly on a, a Saturday evening, are talent programs. Um, we can think of um, ones, we can think of X Factor, we can think of Britain's Got Talent or Ireland's Got Talent or whatever um, people watch. And today's parable that we're looking at is often called the parable of the talents. Now, there's no singing, there's no dancing in it. When we think about talents now, that's the sort of thing we think about. And some people can think, you know, I have no talents. Um, but of course, in the parable, that's not what talents are. Talents are um, a unit of currency, we could say, about a thousand euro is one talent. Um, and it's something of value. And of course, that's what a talent, as we call it today, is. It's something of value, which we all have, whether it's um, easily recognisable or public, like singing or dancing or whatever the sort of thing competitions are built on. But it's something of value we've all been given, which we can use to contribute to the world and to those around us. Of course, the parables are all about the kingdom of God. They unpack for us what it looks like to live under the rule of Jesus Christ as our King. And today's parable is teaching us what it means for Christ's servants to serve him with what they've been given, with their talents. Of course, like all parables, it's not told in a vacuum, this is part of a longer part of Matthew's Gospel, which begins in chapter 24, when it, dealing with um, a, a question the disciples ask him about when will his, what will his coming be like and what will the end of the world be like and when will it be? In the disciples' minds, those things are separate. Of course, we know from what Jesus teaches that they are one and the same thing. The end of the world will only come when... Jesus Christ returns again. The parable begins like this in verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man travelling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Now think about the context. Jesus, of course, is, is going to come again, but that implies he's going to go away um, as he did at his ascension. And so the parable is about the in-between times, between Jesus traveling like the master into a far country, ascending to heaven, and then his coming again at the end of all things. Jesus is the master in this parable. And we're going to think about who the servants are in a few moments. Now, bosses are not um, always popular. Because, like all of us, they're not perfect. And yet Jesus is the perfect boss. He is the perfect master. Because he is perfect. We can think of the care and compassion and the grace he showed in his life with people. That is the kind of master that we are dealing with. The third servant uh, at the end of the parable, his problem was he had a wrong view of his master. And so if we're to get a right view of what it means to serve Christ as our master, we need to keep in mind that he is the perfect master. God could do anything. God could do everything himself without using us, without working through us and giving us a share 
in his ministry in this world. But he does. That is the mystery of the church, that we are called by God to play our part in the spread and work of his kingdom on earth. As the master delivered unto his servants his goods, he entrusted them. He gave them a share in his work. He gave them responsibility. And so it is with all those who are Christ's servants, those who believe in the Lord Jesus, who live with him as their king, who seek to serve him and please him with their lives. Now, a servant sounds like a very um, lowly thing, a very inferior thing. We don't um, think much about servants in our um, day and time. Um, we think of it as a very a thing with, with not much dignity. Um, and of course, there are people in the world who are in that situation, and it is a position where they're, they are not dignified. And it can be a very derogatory thing. But it is a privilege to be a servant of God because he is that perfect master. And we don't even deserve to be servants. In the ancient world, the servant was a member of the household. They were part of the extended family, so to speak. And, and, and we, because of Christ, are adopted as members of Christ's family. We are members of the household of God, which we do not deserve. It's not by nature. We're not born members of this household. We are adopted. And so it is a privilege. A privilege to be a servant of God. In the Roman Catholic Church, we know there's a process of canonization um, where someone is um, officially declared a saint. Um, and there's different stages in that process. And the first stage is that someone is given the title servant of God. Someone who's being on the way to being canonized and written as a saint. Their first step is they are a servant of God. And all those who are Christ's are saints. All those who are Christ are servants of God. That is the term that best describes our role and our position in relation to Christ and his kingdom. Um, minister is a term that we usually think of as someone who's in a position or a specific office, whether religious or political. Um, but the word minister just means servant. And so there is a sense in which we are all ministers. We are all servants of God and therefore of each other. When we think of um, those saints and apostles and early leaders of the church, um, we think of them as people of great authority and status, and by God's grace they were. But they were still servants, and they knew it. When we read the epistles of the New Testament, um, it's a, it can seem back to front to us, because they write their names at the start of the letter as opposed to the end. And that's the way that ancient letters were written. But listen to how these four leaders of the church, writers of New Testament documents, describe themselves. Paul, he describes himself as a servant of Christ Jesus. He describes himself as a servant of God. Peter says this at the start of his second epistle. Simon Peter, a servant an apostle of Jesus Christ. Servant comes first. James describes himself as a servant of God. And then Jude describes himself as the servant of Jesus Christ. They were leaders, but they were first and foremost and primarily and always servants. And they were content to be servants because they had learned this contentment from the servant king himself, our Lord Jesus Christ. Throughout his ministry, he described himself as being among his disciples as one that serveth. We get such a clear example of this at the Last Supper um, when he washed his disciples' feet. Of course, as the letter to the Philippians describes it, he was the one who, oh God, took upon him the form of a servant and who humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. We are to follow in his example who has served us by humbling himself 
and doing what was required so that we might be rescued. He is our master. He is our perfect master. And as I've said, a right view of our service depends on a right view of our master. So often people have um, an idea of God and um, similar to what the, the third servant has in the parable. And he says, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed, and I was afraid. That's the image of God that people have often had. Particularly in this country, that's the image of God that was dominant. God, you know, was distant and cold and out to catch you out, waiting to see when you trip up. But that is not the kind of God we serve, um, as we see how he treats his servants and um, how he entrusts his goods to them. He is a gracious and perfect master. As our prayer book says, to serve him is perfect freedom. How we are to use our talents, we get a lot of insight into that in this um, parable and how the, the servants are dealt with. Each of the servants receives a different amount of talents. One receives five, one receives two, and one receives one. And they are not lesser because of that. And of course, we're all different. We all have different skills and qualities and talents and opportunities. But we are not lesser because of that. And we can get very stressed and think, oh, well, such and such a person can do this and I can't. And it can seem a bit, you know, frustrating, but it's actually liberating. For example, I know I'm never going to win X Factor. And so there is no point in me wasting my time and energy focusing on that. when that is not what God has created or called me to do. The only way we will find purpose and satisfaction in life is if we are living within his will. Each of the um, servants is given a talent according to his ability, verse 15 tells us. And God knows our abilities better than we do. We like to think maybe our abilities are more than, 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 than they seem, but God knows and God has equipped us for that. We've all been given different talents, um, not just skills and, and experiences and qualities and things like that, but what the things we've been given which we can use to serve the Lord. There are those things we've just mentioned, those things which we commonly call talents. Um, and that doesn't mean just in the life of the church, though that is important. It can be used in so many ways. Um, it's not just about standing up and preaching. There are so many different aspects of our life as a church that need um, skill, people to, to share their skills. But also just in our jobs or in our occupations or what we do each day. That in itself is a vocation to be lived to the glory of God. That is where he has placed us. Of course, we have been given money on, and, and resources of some sort. And it can be controversial to talk about giving. But if we've been given something, well, then it's been given so that we can use it to the Lord's glory who has given it. Time. Time is money. And sometimes time can be more valuable than money. Um, giving time to someone, giving time to the church, um, giving time um, in a whole host of ways. That is something we have, and we have more time than we think we have. As someone once said, you know, if you find you're too busy to pray, you're too busy. Because we do have time. If we work up the amount of hours in, in the week, we do have time if we use it and prioritize it. You know, how much time do we spend watching the television or watching things online? And compared to that, how much time do we give to serving the kingdom? God will be just, um, and because he'll be just, um, he will judge those who've received more and more strictly. Notice um, that the, the second servant, he was not judged when he got two talents, he wasn't judged for, for, gain, for not gaining five. The Lord didn't expect him to do the impossible. The Lord expected him to serve him with what he'd been given and to achieve what he had the power to achieve. So often people ask the question, of what about those who have never heard of Christ? And of course, the reality is, 
What about you who has heard of Christ? We have been given such opportunities in our nation, so much so that we were called the island of saints and scholars. We have Bibles available to us. We have heard the name of Jesus. Many of us were baptized and brought up in the church. And because of that, we will be judged more strictly for what we've been given. What the Lord is looking for is faithfulness more than results. At times when we are faithful, we don't see the results. And in a sense, it's a test of our faithfulness. Um, do we remain faithful, trusting in God? Or do we become discouraged and do we give up? The Lord is looking for faithfulness. The results are his to give. By grace, all of those who are believers in Christ are servants of Christ and members of the household of God. As servants of so gracious a master, our greatest desire ought to be to please him in every aspect of our lives here. And so here, when we finish the work he's given us to do, his wonderful words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Now to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be all praise, dominion, glory, and power, forever and ever. Amen.